Chancellor, President, members of the university, fellow graduands, ladies and gentlemen. It's always a pleasure to come to Toronto, especially when you put on such beautiful weather as today. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. And it is indeed an honor for me at this convocation to have received this honorary Doctor of Science from the university today. But listening to all the jobs I seem to have had, it looks as if I can't keep a job for more than five minutes. <laughs> this is one of the great universities of the world, with 85,000 students, 15,000 of them graduate students, 15,000 from overseas, with great traditions in research, Banting and McLeod, the discoverers of insulin, the understanding of diabetes, Nobel 1923. Nobel Prize in Chemistry, 1986, John Polliani, who I had lunch, met just before lunch today. Authors, Northrop Frey, Robertson Davies, both of whom I've read, intellectuals like Marshall McLuhan, who I simply didn't understand. <laughs> I'm indeed honored to become part of this community. Now, the most important thing I have to say today is to congratulate the new graduates, PhD students, undergraduates, or master students from the Faculty of Law. It takes a lot of work to get a degree, especially from one as good as this university. So congratulations on all you have achieved. You should be proud of yourselves, and you should thank those who have helped you to get here, who are also proud of you, your parents, your relatives, your partners, your friends, your colleagues. They are all very proud of you, and so am I. Congratulations. Some of you may carry on in an academic career. Some of you will take what you've learned here for some alternative career. Some of you will do something quite different. But whatever it is that you decide to do, good luck in your future to all of you. Ancient honorary graduates like me are usually expected to offer good advice to new graduates. In thinking about this, I'm always reminded of Oscar Wilde's thoughts about advice. He said, the only thing to do with good advice is to pass it on. It's never of any use to oneself. But despite that, I'll say a few things. The first is to recommend that all your lives you keep your curiosity. You will have it now, but it often diminishes as you get older. The world is a wonderful place, endlessly interesting, which can enchant you all your life. I agree with the historian, George Trevelyan, who said, disinterested intellectual curiosity is the lifeblood of real civilization. The second thing I want to tell you is remain passionate, be an enthusiast, embrace causes, pursue your interests, care about the world, care about the people in that world. Do not let grass grow under your feet. Do things, as Horace said in the first century BC, carpe diem, while we are talking, time is fleeing, seize the day. My third piece of advice, keep your sense of humor. Whilst being intensely curious, passionate, and enthusiastic, and so on, do not forget to laugh, particularly at yourself. It's one of the best anecdotes to the downs in life. It is humor, being able to laugh, not to take yourself too seriously. These are my suggestions for advice to you. But do not forget what the great British scientist Max Perutz said about advice 
after a similar speech like this. He said, one final word, never follow the advice of your elders. I want to say now something more generally about university education and research. Higher education is becoming very complex, especially with the focus on financial targets, budgets, research assessment, impact, strategic aims, and so on. And with all of this, it can be easy to lose sight of the main reason for having a university. It is to teach students at all levels to think, to value freedom of thought, to be tolerant of others' opinions, to respect innovation. Robert Hutchins of Chicago University summed much of this up by saying, education is not to reform students or to amuse them or even to make them expert technicians. It is to inflame their intellects, to teach them to think. Students need to be taught to think and to think differently. If they leave a university without the passion to challenge, to disagree, to quest for truth, however uncomfortable, then that education has failed. It's an honorable charge you have, members of the university. Let me turn to research, especially scientific research, because that's my trade. That is what I do. I still have a research laboratory. My strong view, passion really, is that research is central to a modern society, particularly if that society is to succeed. It provides the knowledge which leads, of course, to a better understanding of ourselves and of the natural world around us. That contributes to our culture and to our civilization, but it also contributes in other ways to the public good, benefiting society, to improving our health, the quality of our lives, driving innovation to support our economies, securing sustainability and protecting the environment. That last benefit is crucial for Canada with so much great and magnificent wilderness. It needs protecting, it needs to be maintained, not just for Canada, but for the rest of the world. Science and knowledge can contribute much to society. Francis Bacon, 17th century English philosopher and statesman said, knowledge is power. Sometimes you see it written over a school. Knowledge is power and science improves learning and knowledge and leads to the relief of man's estate. In other words, knowledge is useful. Very useful, in fact. There is almost nothing that we do in our lives, every hour, indeed, of our lives, which has not been touched by what science and research and the pursuit of knowledge has delivered over the, over the centuries. In the natural sciences, the social sciences, humanities, arts, medicine, engineering, all contribute to everything that we do every day. Carrying out research is a demanding task. Researchers need to have in-depth knowledge, be creative, understand the values of the academic endeavor. Researchers are creative, they thrive on freedom of thought to pursue an investigation wherever it leads to uncover sometimes uncomfortable truths. A researcher who is restrained or is too strongly directed from above will never be effective. Similarly, in my view, societies that are not free and do not encourage the free exchange of ideas or free discussion will not thrive. From what I've read and have been told on recent times, sometimes government researchers in Canada have not had the best of times in recent years. But maybe this will change in the coming months and years. It's very important that scientists are allowed to speak and are properly funded. Perhaps the tide is turning such that research can contribute more to society, to the economy, to the public good. 
I certainly hope so. I've been a scientist for many years, and I've emphasized just now the more utilitarian aspects of research and science, what it is useful for. But that is not the whole story. As I've said, science contributes greatly to our culture and to civilization. And I want to finish with a quote from Robert Wilson. He was the first director of the Fermilab, the large particle accelerator located in, Char in Chicago, now superseded by CERN in Geneva. He was being questioned in the 1960s, I believe, by the US Congress as to how Fermilab would help national security. When he was given that question, he replied, it has to do with the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has nothing to do directly with defending our country, except to help it make, to help make it worth defending. Great quote. Thank you, University of Toronto. Congratulations again to all of you graduates. Thank you.